Welcome to JCT TV. This is Bible study for the 21st century. I hope you've enjoyed Dave Toyson as much as I have. He is the uh, long serving former president of World Vision Canada. He also worked for many years for World Vision USA. He is an American, he's also a Canadian, he's got dual citizenship, but he has insights into the work of World Vision that few people have. World Vision is one of the highest profile Christian charities out there in the world today. You're fully aware of them. And uh, we're gonna wrap up a very interesting conversation with him in just a moment. JCT TV is the official voice of WOW, working for orphans and widows. Jim Cantillon is the founder of WOW and has been ministering to orphans and widows in distress for 18 years. WOW's focus is home-based care for the dying. The horizon is vast, with thousands of the least of these in Africa and India. WOW depends on your generous support. To do so, simply contact us by phone, mail, or online. Dave Toyson is my guest. This is for the fourth interview, and I am loath to say it's the last one, at least for a while. I, I want to have him back. But there's a question I want to ask, and it, I think it's an important question. I think it's a question a lot of you want to ask about World Vision, and uh, if there's anyone who can answer it, it's Dave Toyson, as a former president of World Vision Canada, and also in his um, earlier years as an American working both in the States and also in Australia. World Vision is so huge, Dave. So massive, so loyally supported by hundreds of thousands of people, but also receiving a lot of money from governments and engaged to a greater or lesser degree with in a multi-faith context mm -hmm. with uh, other religious traditions. Mm -hmm. There are those who stand back and say World Vision has lost its way. Mm -hmm. Started out as a Christian evangelical organization, but now it's beholden to government monies and the compromises they have to make because of that. That's the assumption. Mm -hmm. And now they're working with that faith group and that faith group. How, do, how have you stick handled through all of this? Hmm. Well, I, I, think one of the, I think one of the important reasons to be concerned about the interfaith peace is that and and even the the secular governments now yeah. are realizing you can't go into countries say that's a Muslim context or a Hindu context or a Christian context, and just ignore religion, right. because it's part of their life. Yeah. It's who they are, yeah. and so that's been a fundamental change. I I would say there's even an awareness with some of the UN agencies as well, uh, that th that this is the reality. If you really want to be uh, effective, you have to engage and respect the religion of the local people. And there have been a number of books actually written by you know, secular development experts that talk about this. And so at World Vision, we, we, we see it, you could, you could stay away from this completely, but our view is we're here to serve the poor mm. and to help people. And sometimes the, the people that need the most help are in other religious contexts. So we've worked out a way because we believe that um, people of all faiths, not everyone in their faith, but generally, they want 
a better future for their children. Yeah. So how can we work together with them? And so what we look for is common, obviously common values around caring for your children. One of the big challenges is girls and women. Mm -hmm. we, we, and, we find, and we're in a number of the other faiths now, they're, they're owning up and wanting to change that as well. And so we go in and work with them. Um, what, we're, what we want to do is we never say, we never uh, make any comment that we're one, not a Christian. We are a Christian organization mm -hmm. and we always say that. But we don't, what we're very clear about is we don't proselytize. And our definition of proselytize is we don't, you know, bait people. You'll, if you take this, we'll get, right. you know, if you take a Bible, we'll help you. Yeah. If you won't, we won't help you. Or you have to go to this church or whatever. We don't do that. Yeah. What, what we're doing is we're saying we're there motivated by our Christian faith. Yeah. And I suppose more than anything, we, we, along with just the basic help we're providing, we hope people will simply ask, well, why are you here? Yeah. G give us a chance to explain why we're here. And then we'll share. We'll share who we are. Mm -hmm. But it's not in any way um, trying to manipulate people in some sort of way to you know, draw them into Christianity. But do we want, do, we're a Christian organization, so we desire for people to embrace Christianity. That's who we are. But we're not gonna use it in a way in which is manipulative and, and it coerces people into it. And, and at the same time, we also believe, I, I believe strongly in this, that God wants all people to have a better life. And, and so we, we need to join up with everybody as we do that together. And God will reveal himself in ways we can't even imagine when that happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, some great stories about that. Tell me one. Well, I, I'm just thinking of, of stories where people will say, you know, we, we've always been concerned about Christians. But now that we've, now that we've worked with you, we like, we like, we like working with you. Mm. And we, and we realize that you care about us. Mm. And sometimes even the love word gets, you know, gets expressed. What a concept, eh? Yeah, what a concept. <laughs> and so, so I think, and, and so I think it's important uh, that Christian organizations understand, see this as an opportunity, not as something to run from. Mm. Because I think the strength of the Christian faith is based on the truth that we believe and God, God is God, we're not. And uh, I think God's quite capable of making sure that uh, God's truth goes forth in a way that's effective and appropriate and yet is helping everyone. Now what about government everybody. funding? Uh, World Vision has accessed, I'm sure, hundreds of millions of dollars over the years from governments. Um, are there strings attached? Well, there's, there's always some strings in terms of accountability. Yeah. But we, I mean, we have to have the freedom to be who we are or we won't take it. Right. I mean, you, you have to do that. Yeah. Uh, but yes, there's no question. There's, there's, you know, it's a different kind of bureaucracy that you have to deal with. Uh, and that does cost us some money. But on the other hand, I have to say, if we didn't get that funding, uh, we, we'd have to stop work that's really valuable. Mm. Uh, things like the humanitarian response, for example. That's, it's huge to be able to have government support to help us do that. Mm. But once again, I think uh, there's ways to handle that and to do it with integrity. And we're not the only, I mean, there are many other Christian mm -hmm. organizations that are doing that as well. Um, <clears throat> what about Dave Toys and the man? Uh, you know, you're, 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 you're a married man, you, you have children. Mm -hmm. Two. Two kids. Uh, boy, four grandkids. Four grandkids. <laughs> Good for you. I've got 12. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not in your league. I'm not in your league. I, I'm just, just giving you. I think Tony Campolo says, you know, grandchildren are the reward for not killing your children. <laughs> uh, what about the Toyson family on this journey? Um, tell me a little bit about the impact on your wife and your children as they've been growing up with their globe trotting father impacting. <sighs> so many tra 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 uh, tragedy situations, war situations, impoverished situations, crisis situations, and then you come home. Do they want to talk about it? Did they want to talk about it? Did they want to go with you? I, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, they've both been able to see the work overseas and it's transformed them. Yeah. They, they're supporters. In yeah. fact, my son James just started working with World Vision USA mm. um, a year ago. Mm. So he's always wanted to do that. Um, I, maybe I can give an anecdote. Yeah. At my retirement, I, 
in my speech, I made a bit of an apology of all the trips I was away, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my two kids afterwards <laughs> just brought me to tears. They took me on and said, that's not true. You were here when we needed you. And, and you, 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 they were offended <laughs> wow. and said, you shouldn't say that because it's not true. You were here for important times with us on a regular basis. And so were they right? I still question it a little bit, <laughs> but no, they think they're, they right. Think they're and, right. And I guess that's what counts well, more. Well, yeah, no kidding. I Diane, mean, my wife, was uh, she was involved, you know, she had a church job, mm. so she had an immediate community mm. of people around her that was really helpful as well. But I, I worked very hard to be a, 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 attend our local church on a regular basis. I got involved in things, but there were times I would, you know, particularly with the humanitarian disasters, they're just so unpredictable. Yeah. But uh, I still think there was some balance in my life, and uh, I'm sure it could have been better. But uh, I, I'm still, you know, resonating because of the the kids taking me on the way they did. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, actually a, a good thing. It's a good thing. I mean, it's great your kids see it that way. Um, you've been uh, unengaged, you know, as a retired former president for a few years. But uh, you're still in touch, and there are those who are still looking to you for wisdom and counsel. Um, if you were back in the president's chair right now, mm -hmm. knowing what you know, knowing where you've been and what you've seen, and also what this last four years has brought to our plate with the never-ending stories of sorrows around the world, would there be anything you would suggest that World Vision might consider to do in a different way or in a new way that was not the case when you were the president? That's a tough one, Jim, because I, I'm a little reluctant as the retired president of course, to, I understand to that. pontificate. I understand, right? I understand that, but I I, just... I'm talking to you as, as Dave Toyson, the visionary, <laughs> yeah, as, right. as the statesman, as the man of God who right. uh, <laughs> has a, a sterling track record, and I'm not asking you to a second guess anybody, but wh well, what, what, where do you think World Vision could be going? Let, let me put it that way. Where could they be going Well, I, I, I mean, I'm proud of what World Vision, I'm speaking particularly about World Vision Canada yeah. at this point, although it might apply to, to other countries a bit yeah. as well. But I, I'm, they're in some of the most challenging times we've ever faced. There's more charities than ever. Yeah. The whole social media thing, television isn't what it used to be in terms of fundraising right. for World Vision. So we're in a major change. And I, I, a lot of organizations have struggled making social media really at a successful fundraiser. Yeah. So I think one of the biggest challenges, and this is, this is not rocket science, there's all kinds of people saying this, is how do we work with the next generation to find out what will work for them? The, the, the millennials particularly, they're, they're, we've got a generational movement going on right now. I, I think back of what it was like, you know, I'm a baby boomer mm -hmm. and I was an American, you know, for my youth and it was the Indochina war. That was, that was a big issue in the country. And, and our generation, we were spoiled a bit by our parents because they were the war generation. Yeah. Yeah. And, we, and we thought the world owed us a lot of stuff. Now, and the good news is a lot of baby boomers have given generously now we're looking at the millennials and there's some some skepticism about that but i think we have to be very careful because i think they're figuring it out their world is so different from ours mm -hmm. the lack of institutional trust for example for good reasons mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the workplace or us and so i just think that's the challenge for people is how do you work in this new environment with change that's happening so radically when so many experts are saying even compared to previous times in history, there's nothing like the change we're dealing with today. To use a today. biblical metaphor from Jesus himself, uh, we're talking about new wine and new wineskins. That's right. That's right. Uh, and anybody who wants to insist on doing things in the old way is going to find themselves marginalized. Yeah, that's right. You, you, you need to be more open to innovation, yeah. experiment more. Yeah. And and I'm proud to say, you know, the organization that I, you know, worked with my last 30 years, I, they're doing a lot of that. Well, uh, they're bearing a lot of fruit that you've planted. And uh, I'll tell you, from my perspective, uh, there's very few names out there that have higher regard than that of Dave Toyson. And I'm not flattering you when I say it. I mean it. And uh, God bless you in whatever the Lord has you doing next. Thank you. Thanks for Thank being you. a part of the Thank show you. for this last four shows. So unbelievable. Yeah, but it's been a team effort. <laughs> it's the donors, it's the staff, oh, sure. you know, oh, and no, the no. people we work with overseas. Of you know? course. It's no, no, amazing. No. No, you're, it's just amazing. You're, no, you're absolutely right. There's no singular heroes in the world of... Uh, of uh, reaching the world with the love of God. Mm -hmm.
Thanks, Dave Toyson. I'll be back right after this break, friends. Jim Kennel on Today is a program dedicated to the teaching of the good news of Jesus Christ. This all through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. JCT also brings to you encouraging testimonies and stories from Christian leaders all over the globe. If this program has added value to your life, would you please consider becoming a partner? To do so, simply contact us by phone, mail, or online. just want you to know, friends, that the Mark uh, edition of Cantal's Casual, Comment- Cantalon's Casual Commentary, that's a tongue twister, is finally out. And it's the first nine chapters of Mark. Uh, the second half will follow in a few weeks, a few months, to be honest, uh, because I, it's going to take me a long time to get there on the show. But uh, a lot of people are accessing this, and it's just a helpful little guide as we go through the Gospels together. There's 55 pages there. It's good stuff. Uh, I've done it this way so it fits in your pocket, your purse. Uh, I can send it to you in an envelope, very cost efficient. And uh, we're happy to send it to you. And remember, uh, when you ask for it, do your best to help us, okay, with our work, both with JCT and also with Working for Orphans and Widows. Wow, the ministry you see promoted on the program every day because that's our outreach to orphans and widows in distress in Sub-Saharan Africa, that's Southern Africa, East Africa, and also now getting into India. Okay? I appreciate your help. I really do. Okay, uh, where are we? Verse 16 of Mark chapter 1. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Now Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. What we know is he's about to make Capernaum his home base. Capernaum is a great little town. Now all that's there now are ruins, but they're very impressive ruins, right on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. I've reminded you this before in the past. I spent some time in the casual commentary talking about it, but it's called the Sea of Galilee. It's no sea. It's about 12 miles long and 6 miles wide. It's shaped like a harp. That's why the Israelis call it Kinneret, which in Hebrew means harp. It's also sometimes been called Gennesaret, uh, named after the plain on the uh, uh, north uh, western shore of, uh, of the lake. Uh, it's sometimes called Lake Tiberias, named after the town that was established in Tiberias' name, which is on the central western shore of the lake. But generally, we know it as the Sea of Galilee. Sometimes in my casual commentary, I call it Canaret. Sometimes I call it the lake. Most of the times I call it the lake. There was no sea, okay? But he's out there walking by uh, the lake. Um, in verse 21, we'll get to you know, Capernaum. But I'm assuming he's already living in Capernaum. Uh, probably boarding in uh, Peter's mother-in-law's house, which was in Capernaum. That's where Peter lived. Could be Andrew lived there too. Andrew was Peter's brother. Anyway, Jesus is walking by the lake. I've walked by the lake many, many times. I mean, we lived in Israel for seven years, and uh, I've been back there many, many times doing television. Walking by the lake is not an easy task. Why? Because it's not a sandy beach like you would think many lakes have. A lot of it's just big old boulders and they're all black. They're basalt rock 
which means that they're the results of uh, uh, lava flow from what we now call Mount Hermon, which is about 20 miles, 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. You can see it from Galilee, actually, on a clear day. It rises about 10,000 feet, often covered in snow. But it's an old volcano. And in centuries past, long before the time of Jesus, in fact, you know, this, vol this lava stream came down and eventually, you know, erosion and so on. And you end up with these big old boulders. And, and so along the lake, it's very, very uh, rocky. And then where there is what you can call beach, it's not really beach. It's just smaller black rock. It's very difficult to walk on. You, know, you don't want to do it in your bare feet unless you're really tough, <laughs> which I'm not. Uh, but I've walked by there many, many times. It's absolutely beautiful. It's uh, a gorgeous scenery. Um, mind you, sometimes a lake can be very tempestuous. You know, it's, it's in a kind of a basin. And it's surrounded on the west, the north, and the east with, uh, they call them mountains. They're not really mountains, but they're really high hills. At the north end is what's known as the Mount of Beatitudes. And when you're at the top of the Mount of Beatitudes, you're looking down on the lake from about a 400 foot height. So, you know, it's, it's a height. But then over on the east side, much, much higher, twice as high as the Mount of Beatitudes, the Golan Heights. Uh, and I've been up there many times, and there are places where there's sheer cliffs, and you're, you're up above the water a good seven, 800 feet in some places. Uh, and then there are plains up there with very um, fertile soil, huge fields, you know, of wheat, various kinds of uh, grains and fruit trees and so on, uh, because that volcanic soil as it has broken down over the centuries has become very, very rich in nutrients. Anyhow, walking by the lake. Peter, Andrew, James, John. Uh, here he mentions, first of all, Peter and Andrew, his brother. Uh, they were local boys. Peter and Andrew, for sure, come from, had come from Bethsaida, or Bethsaida, which is a town on the northeastern quadrant uh, of the uh, coming down to the Sea of Galilee. It's sort of, uh, it's marginal. It may be upper, it may be the northernmost reach of lower Galilee as the beginning of upper Galilee. It also may be what the Romans called the, the Golanitis, the province of Golanitis, and Golanitis is where you get Golan. Um, but anyway, it's, it's not right on the water. It's about, I would say, half a mile from the water, but it's right on the upper Jordan River. The Jordan River is coming down all the way from Mount Hermon, and it's called the Upper Jordan until it gets down to the southern end of the lake where it's called the Lower Jordan. And at that time, the river would be significant, and this provided them with their fishing boats access to the lake. Now, they may have had, you know, uh, probably they had some kind of dockage for boats as well, right on the lake, but Bethsaida itself was on the Jordan and had access to the lake. And this is where Andrew and Peter uh, were from, but now they had taken up residence in Capernaum, but they were fishermen. I mean, that's what you do there. Bethsaida was a fishing town. Capernaum was a fishing town. Now, Capernaum was also a central place of trade because the international trade routes came right through Capernaum. Uh, so there were uh, foreign... Uh, uh, trains, camel trains of goods and so, uh, coming through all the time. And it was a rich place to tax foreign um, uh, goods. And so the Romans had a kind of a customs house there. And, uh, you know, it, it was full of uh, exotic looking people from all over the world. Uh, and it was a part of what um, the Old Testament prophets referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles. It, it was in many ways more Gentile than Jewish in its essential uh, culture. So, uh, Jesus is walking. He sees these fishermen. They're actually in the act of casting a net into the sea. And, you know, Mark again gives us no preamble. And Surely, there must have been more than this one sentence, but this is the one sentence that's important to Mark. Jesus says to them, follow me, and I'll make you to become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. 
Now, I've said all along, I don't refer to Matthew, I don't refer to Luke, I don't refer to John deliberately. I'm just dealing with Mark right now. Just like with Matthew, I dealt with Matthew. Uh, but there's a lot of gaps here. You wonder, why would they immediately leave and follow him? Well, you'll discover in some of the other Gospels that there had been some exposure to Jesus, certainly on Andrew's part. And he was the one who brought Simon to Jesus in some other context. And so, in a sense, as he's walking by and he sees them, it's not the first time he's seen them. He's met these guys before. And there has been some kind of interaction between them, some kind of bonding. I, I don't know to what extent. Anyhow, when he asks them to follow him, they immediately follow him. And they, they, you know, they must have had their reasons. Of course they would. Sometimes when it's a case of deciding to follow Jesus, it's just visceral. It's something in your gut. You just have a sense this is the right thing to do. You feel constrained to do it. The Bible calls it the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. But however it happens, when you have a sense that you should follow Jesus, it's a good idea. Drop your nets, follow him now. The Bible tells us that true religion is visiting orphans and widows in their distress. The Bible also says that God is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. Heaven's core values for mankind begin with God's heart for the least of these. When you support WOW, you're in the sweet spot of God's heart for the poor. Yes, we're only a small player in this great drama, but at least we're on the field. Please give generously. Friends, uh, finally, I've got Canlon's Casual Commentary. Mark edition, this is chapters one through nine, available for you. Um, this doesn't come lightly, by the way. It takes me months and months and months to write these things. Uh, it's 55 pages. It's designed so it fits in an envelope or your pocket or your purse, into your Bible, whatever. But it's uh, a little help for you in terms of just keeping track with me as I go through this thing on television. It's also good just for your own private devotions. Uh, it's casual, it's not heady, it's not condescending, kind of just speaks from the shoulder, maybe a little bit like Mark, but I think you'll enjoy it. And when you ask for it, please remember to support JCT and WOW. We're not just concerned about proclaiming the gospel, we're also concerned about living the gospel, and that's why we both teach it and live it with orphans and widows in needy parts of the world. Thanks for watching. Oh, oh.